1620, while the Mayflower was in Provincetown, 18 of its men sailed in a small shallop, searching for a place to live. They came to present-day East Ham, where they were met by a group of Nosset. After a brief but violent encounter, the English left towards today's Plymouth. In 2020, we remember this first encounter. We explore its meanings for today and tomorrow. Welcome everyone back to the Sunset Series of the East Ham 400. Back with us tonight for the second part of his presentations on how salt marshes have changed over the years is biologist Stephen Smith of the Cape Cod National Seashore. Okay, hi there everybody. Uh, so I'm going to um, engage in the second part of my talk here. Um, uh, uh, a few years ago we, we undertook this big project to try to assess the vulnerability of our salt marshes to sea level rise here. Um, and this, this was a major effort that required a lot of uh, data collection in the field. And one of the most important parameters that we wanted to, to look at it was elevation of these marshes. So we took this uh, um, RTK GPS unit, which, uh, which records elevation very accurately. And each one of these, these green points you see in this, this particular marsh in Provincetown represents a place where uh, our technicians put down that instrument and recorded an elevation. And we did this for all our major marsh systems, as well as recording a very specific tidal uh, data for each embayment. And from that, we're able to you know, put this information into, into GIS software and interpolate it or smooth all those points out and, and get a base layer elevation so uh, uh, that we can tie into um, that we can relate to, to tidal elevations and, and, and tidal dynamics in the system. And then using those variables as well as salt marsh accretion from our sediment elevation tables that I discussed in the first uh, part of this talk uh, and some literature values on productivity of, uh, of salt marsh grasses based on elevation, we're able to construct a, a simple model to try to predict how marshes would respond to two different scenarios of sea level rise, one being a very conservative rise of 50 centimeters by the year 2100, and one being a more uh, severe rise of, of one meter by, um, by the year 2100. And so in these graphs, the gray area represents um, uh, healthy, uh, you know, normally functioning marsh. The black area represents marsh that has been uh, converted to mud flats or vegetation has been lost through sea level rise. And the white, the the white part is um, is the high marsh habitat, which is distinct from the low marsh habitat in gray there. So, with even just a little bit of sea level rise, almost all our high marsh habitat. Um, uh, vanishes and that's that's actually a really important part of the ecosystem for a variety of organisms including uh, uh, salt marsh sparrows um, and then with a one meter or 100 centimeters of sea level rise we start to lose a lot of marsh to it just collapses into mud flat because it cannot handle that flooding stress um, so we did all these calculations for uh, our different marshes uh, within the national seashore here's here's a couple more examples from the gut in, in, in Wellfleet and Pleasant Bay. So they all do sort of different things depending on um, uh, what their slopes are and elevations relative to their, the, the specific tidal range in their embayments, but uh, it's the same pattern. We lose high marsh really quickly and then we start to lose a lot of low marsh. And as I said, some, some, some of that high marsh habitat is really important nesting habitat for um, endangered bird species like salt marsh sparrows. Okay. So one of the things that salt marshes can do in response to sea level rise, other than being squeezed out of existence, is to migrate upslope. Um, and that depends on a number of things, however. So as, as, as when sea level rises surpasses vertical accretion, um, you know, the production of that root material and the buildup of marshes, as I discussed previously, landward migration can occur. Um, and so you see a transition, and we, we saw it in the, the pictures of the high marsh disappearing. Uh, everything's sort of transgressing land, in a landward direction. The problem is the borders of a lot of these salt marshes um, have either been, a lot of them have been highly developed, so marshes can't really go anywhere. They can't grow through a, through a, a supermarket parking lot or a subdivision. Um, 
even there's some natural barriers like steep slopes of adjacent uplands can uh, in very obvious ways prevent uh, uh, marshes from migrating landward very far. And then we have uh, barrier beaches which provide great opportunities for marshes to migrate to but um, they're being uh, consumed by sea level rise and, and sort of degrading and are expected to fall apart with continued sea level rise. So losing some opportunities there for uh, marsh migration. Ele the elevation maps that we've determined from uh, the Salt Marsh Vulnerability Project as well as LIDAR, um, remote sensing of the upland has allowed us to kind of figure out where marshes could go with say one level or one meter of sea level rise. Um, that's shown here. So um, we sort of delineated the, the upper edge of the salt marsh and then figured out with one meter of sea level rise based on the slopes of that adjacent upland how, how much marsh could be created there. And we did this um, throughout the seashore. Again, some of the major impediments to our migration are infrastructure, you know, big uh, impermeable uh, um, cement concrete areas and riprap and marinas and so forth. So. Uh, there's a limited uh, area where salt marshes can, can, uh, can climb up slope to escape drowning from sea level rise. Um, also the, the slope of the adjacent upland, as I alluded to previously, uh, uh, is, is um, important for a number of reasons, but slopes of, of more than 5% incline are extremely limiting to migration. So we had to parse out all that adjacent upland habitat to figure out where marshes could go. And this is sort of what it looks like. Um, the six major marsh areas, it's really interesting in that, um, you know, there's very little room for marsh expansion through migration in many marshes, except for Hatches Harbor in, in Provincetown in the upper left-hand corner. There's a huge area where marshes could migrate into the dunes uh, um, and, and develop into, into, into salt marsh there. There's an airport in the way, Provincetown Airport, and some seashore infrastructure that would have to be moved to accommodate that. Um, whereas some of the big island type marshes, like Nosset uh, Marsh, it, by virtue of the fact that these are large chunks of that marsh are islands, they have no adjacent upland to, to uh, migrate to. So we're really worried that systems like Nosset, East Ham's you know, primary marsh, um, is going to collapse. There's going to be a catastrophic loss there with accelerated sea level because um, they have nowhere to go, essentially. Um, and again, as I said, uh, erosion of the barrier islands, which themselves are landforms that uh, you know, could um, provide opportunities for migration. Those are eroding away pretty quickly. You know, large, uh, they're retreating uh, large distances after every winter storm. Um, and so that, again, limits opportunities for migration as well. Um, unfortunately, climate change and sea level rise can't be managed at the, the park level, the level of you know, Cape Cod National Seashore. So what we can do is um, try to ameliorate other kinds of stresses that are uh, on salt marshes to make them possibly more resilient to uh, sea level rise. Um, we will need to move infrastructure around, possibly like in uh, Provincetown, to accommodate for uh, marsh retreat and, and overland migration. Um, and those are big endeavors, but um, necessary to in the future to uh, to consider if we want to preserve our our important resource here. And that is uh, that is it. Thanks for listening. I just want to acknowledge some of my. Uh, Cape Cod National Seashore lab mates and p people that have come through the seashore and helped us uh, collect all this data and put it together. So thank you. My name is Joanna Hollick. Thank you for your support of the Sunset Series and East Ham 400. If you're interested in supporting East Ham 400 efforts by purchasing commemorative items, we do have several items for sale on our website, easthamp400.org. We are selling gold foil first encounter ornaments t-shirts with the East Ham 400 logo, and montages made by a local artist. The ornaments feature an image of the shallop and come with a special description card. The t-shirts are available in light blue, navy, and ash gray, and in sizes adult small through 3XL. The montage depicts watercolor images of important historic and well-known landmarks around the town of East Ham. Each of these items are $20. Thank you.